Gabe, uh, Gabe Brown has already covered some of it, <laughs> but in a different sense. Gabe's doing some wonderful work and he's part of the country. Um, I will add to something that Gabe also said, and notice I have their regenerative, and I'll say what Gabe, repeat what Gabe said, we talk about sustainable and sustainability all the time. That is not good enough. This planet that we have now is already in a bad state. Um, why, do we want, why do we want to keep it like that? We need to regenerate it and restore it. My um, farm, uh, which is called Winona, in Australia we name all of our farms. Um, and um, a couple of thousand acres, it's 200 miles northwest of Sydney, uh, Australia. It's only granite soil, so all the, the photos that I show you of grasslands and soil and that, it, it isn't a naturally fertile soil, as, as much of Australia isn't. Uh, it's, it is nat naturally quite um, infertile soil in Australia. The uh, rainfall is, is reasonable where I am, 26 inch rainfall. Um, we now have a restored native grassland. Um, I said about restoring it, which I will uh, tell you about as I go through this talk. My great grandfather came uh, to Australia in the 1850s from, in the Gold Rush and, and settled in the area now, and we're still on the same farm that he settled. Uh, we've added to it. We own just uh, all, all neighbours, basically. The observant amongst you may notice that my great grandfather there has only got one leg, and at this state at time, I remind everyone that it is not a genetic uh, defect, <laughs> the one leg. He actually fell off a wagon at <laughs> one time. We've always run, run merino sheep. Merino sheep are, one, are, are the major animals run in Australia, and, and that's for wool production. Um, and we still run merino sheep. Um, we run 4,000 merino sheep. We run cattle, but we usually trade in, in cattle. Um, uh, also, run, uh, we run one of the largest kelpie uh, uh, working dogs in the world, actually. Um, kelpies are a unique uh, Australian breed of working dog. We also now harvest and sell native grass seed, and I'm going to talk more about that. It's part of the enterprise that developed because of the change in land management. So how do we feed 9 billion people without destroying this planet? We certainly want to do it, we need to do it better than we're doing it now. There's no doubt about that. We will not have a planet to stand on if we continue our agricultural practices that we have in place at the moment. It's interesting that many of the speakers uh, love having a go at multinational company, companies and I'm certainly uh, going to have a go at them also. <laughs> because they deserve uh, to uh, be given a hard time. For the last 60 years, the, the Green Revolution um, we're concentrated on, on, on um, monoculture crops supported by um, large amounts of fertiliser and, and pesticides. This really has been a, a, a major ecological disaster. Um, and you'll find I will speak a lot about ecology. Very rarely uh, ecology and agriculture are ever mentioned in the same sentence. Um, we, we certainly should uh, be farming in a more sound ec ecological manner. Agriculture is crashing all over the world because it doesn't function in an ecologically sound way. Almost all the problems that we have in agriculture are, rela are, are related to lack of ecological function. And if, you, and if you think about the things like our soils, our soils have declined. We have low carbon levels now. Um, we, um, we, uh, we now have reduced soil fertility, so we put more fertiliser on. We have insect attacks, so we put more insecticide on. Um, we have crop diseases, so we put more fungicide on. There seems to be a bit of a pattern going here. And, um, so if something goes wrong, we put more on. We put more fertiliser on, we put more, more, more pesticide on. And I like to call that the, the moron principle. <laughs> so <laughs> that's exactly what it is. <laughs> In more ways than one. <laughs> Agriculture all around the world lack, lacks, lacks resilience and ecological function. 
We need our agricultural systems to be more resilient. Uh, we need to bounce back from dry times and droughts and floods and, and that. Nature does. Nature doesn't have any problems with droughts and floods. It's only us stupid humans that, that are, are the ones with the problem. I'll tell you a little bit of a, hist a bit of history to, to explain why I do things differently. In the 1930s, my father, using the best science of the day, my father was a very innovative uh, a man, and he, he used the best science that was available at that time. He grew some very good wheat crops, um, uh, obviously done conventionally. He, he, um, he was very proud of this, this, uh, this old tractor, which was a Twin City Minneapolis Marlene tractor, but uh, because he was using horses pr pr before that. If you look at that wheat, wheat crop, and I'll go on to the next, next slide, that is a photo of seven years later in that same paddock. If you look at the hill behind it, for years I was too embarrassed to show that photo <laughs> of our family shooting these eagles. Um, if you shot one now, it'd be probably a thousand dollar fine, I think. <laughs> but it's not, I haven't got it up there for, to show the eagle, but to show that soil erosion. And that was only seven years after that crop was, was, was planted. That erosion ended up 10 feet deep. My father had to change. He, he basically destroyed the, the farm, and that's because he, he, was, he was ploughing ground and cropping fairly continuously. What he did was, again, using the best science that, that was available at the time, went into high-input agriculture and used lots of fertiliser. Um, he was even using, starting to use pesticides, certainly insecticides, um, ploughing, cultivating uh, soil. Managing as, as we did uh, sorry, in that era, um, he did it uh, earlier than most other people. He was very innovative and started earlier. Um, and it did work very well in that era. However, that method was costing us in today's figures. And it was $80,000 annually on today's money. And we were destroying uh, the, the farm while we were spending all that money. High input agriculture started to crash on, on my farm, on, on Winona, in the 1970s. Fertiliser costs became too high. The, the cost of re-sowing um, uh, our pastures for, 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 for sheep uh, became too high. Rainfall no longer infiltrated. Soils became compacted. Carbon levels uh, crashed. Salinity problems, you name it, we had it. <laughs> and we were going broke. So something had to be done. If you look at this, this is not an, un, un, an uncommon common story in Australia, and it's not an, un, an uncommon story, story anywhere in the world. And it's because of this. That, like, there is a desperate need to change agricultural practices around the world because industrialised agriculture is failing all over the world. It, it is hitting the wall everywhere. But it's OK to say that, but what, how do we change? What do we change to? It, that, that it isn't so simple to change. How did I change? Well, I was, I was looking at, um, even as a teenager, looking at different ways of doing things and knowing that this really wasn't working um, until what changed me was, was this. We had a major wildfire, we, a bushfire we call it in Australia, that destroyed everything, we destroyed our whole farm, the whole district actually, but we lost house, our, our sheds or barns, we lost 3,000 sheep, almost all of our fencing, we were, went into instant broke. <laughs> uh, I had no choice, we had, we had no money, I had to change or walk off the farm. Um, everything on the farm was burnt, there was, was not a, a, anything standing at all. So. How did I change, um, and, and what did I change to, or base, how did I change? I looked for low input agricultural methods, was, was the main thing. I had no money. I had to find a way of, 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 of staying on the farm and farming, or, or, or farming and ranching. So I went searching for a way of doing it without any, out any money. And this is what, I, what, what, what developed. Um, so I stopped using, using fertilisers um, in, in, in 1980. Uh, couldn't afford them anyway. Stopped using pesticides. I started to focus on 100% ground cover. And I started to focus on uh, native grasses because I knew they didn't need high levels of fertiliser. Now, 
Of course, I was labelled a lunatic at that stage because no one else thought native grasses were any good at all. I focused on restoring Winona to a grassland. Started time control grazing. I'm, not, I'm a bit like Gabe, I'm not going to talk very much about grazing at all today. I'm going to talk about how, how we, we, we plant crops and, and, and what I developed that way. So but I, we develop, I developed pasture cropping techniques in, 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 19, in 1993 and then, then I, I realised that if we combined really good grazing management with pasture cropping, then we'd kick some goals. This is the most important slide that I have. <laughs> it is a, a bottle of Australian beer. Now, most of you probably know that, that well, Australians have a reputation all around the world of being beer drinkers. Germans are probably better, but not by much. Uh, and I'm no different. <laughs> One night, a very good friend of mine, Daryl Clough, and I were sitting drinking many of these beers. <laughs> and we came up with this lunatic idea. We were drunk enough to think, of, think at the time that this was a good idea. <laughs> the, the most interesting thing is that we actually remembered it next morning. <laughs> and then we started to worry about, because we used to do this quite often, <laughs> we started to worry about all the really good ideas that we, we, we probably dreamt up when we were drunk but can't, couldn't remember next morning. So, but this one we remembered. Remember, even though I'm not going to talk about it, it's very important to have our grazing, grazing up right. We, and, and what we call it doesn't matter. Mob grazing, time control grazing, soil grazing. I, I generally call it time control grazing. Pasture cropping itself is it's actually a land management technique. Annual crops are zero tilled or no tilled in, into dormant perennial grass or grassland. I did tell you I was a bit of a lunatic um, because that's supposed to be impossible because for five, at least 5,000 years, maybe yeah, at least 5,000 years, we have killed our, our, everything to, to plant a crop. We've done it with, with the ploughing and cultivation, then, then, then with herbicides. So. It was a lunatic idea, and, and you really have to be drunk to think of something so stupid. But it could be called perennial cover cropping. Um, and it's probably easier to understand to call, to call, call it that. Now, I've just got a sequence of photos here that, that does describe it uh, reasonably well. Um, this is a, a, a grassland. That, these grasslands now have about 60 or 70 species in them. That grassland, I haven't planted any of that. That has returned because of management. It's returned because of, of, of changing grazing management. Pasture cropping technique itself really stimulates uh, grasslands, makes them grow, grow better and, 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 and uh, gets more diversity. I'll talk about that later. Then, after mulching with sheep and or cattle, we're zero, t zero tilling the, 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 uh, the crop. We've used mulch in, in, in veggie patches, veggie gardens for probably thousands of years, the Chinese have at least. Uh, so why don't we do it in agriculture? Why, why do we have bare ground all the time? With that sort of mulch, and remember that's all mulch perennial, perennial grass, a perennial grassland that's been mulched with, with animals and you've got, so you've got additional manure and urine, manure and urine on there as well. So you don't need a herbicide. Oh, by the way, that cap there, that hat, there's no one underneath that cap. The, the, the litter isn't that thick. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> so. oh, these are photos that have been taken in the same, same spot. This is uh, uh, in September. Now, we can certainly gra graze the, these crops, and, and we do as well, so that we've got uh, animal forage, green forage on, the, on, on these as well. Then we have a, a, a crop which is getting towards harvest, then we're harvesting the, the crop with the green perennial uh, grass underneath it. After that crop is, is, is harvested, then we can graze it again. Um, but by the way, just a, a matter of interest, more useless information, is about, we run mobs of about 3,000, that, that main mob is about 3,000 sheep. We then have the, 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 the opportunity to harvest uh, native grass seed off it. Now, this native grass seed, I, 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 I sell it. It's, it's, a, it's a, a major, uh, a very important enterprise for me, uh, for rehabilitation work, selling to other farmers that, that want to, want to uh, plant 
native grasses. But our Australian Aboriginal people are one of the oldest races of people in, in, in the world. Um, they've, they've, no one really knows, but they've been, uh, they're at least 50 or 60,000 years old, or they've been in Australia for that long. Um, and the, the main, one of their main diets was native grass seed. The native people lived off, off of our grasslands for you know, thousands of years. So there's no reason why we can't do it uh, as well. Now, if we look at that crop over a 12 month period, or that, that paddock, that field, we had grazing of the grassland pre-sowing the crop. We had grazing of the crop with sheep and or cattle. We, had, we got grain from the crop. We got grazing of grassland after the crop and native grass seed. Now, that, uh, now it, we, um, we've reduced our fertiliser input now by 70%. We use very, li very little fertiliser. And I'm using more organic fertilisers now. We, there has been no, no herbicide, no insecticide, no fungicide on that at, at all to, to produce that, that crop. And we've got all of that production off, off, off that one area. By the way, I, um, I plant crops in about a quarter of the farm, but the grazing and the cropping areas are one and the same. There are, the, the crops aren't here and the grazing is there. They're all, it's all interrelated, uh, or all integrated. This technique will produce crops for, for, for grain and or grazing. It, it, it will uh, improve pastures by stimulating perennial grass species and diversity. We can restore grasslands with this, te this technique very, very rapidly. And I'll explain a little bit later if I don't run out of time uh, on, on just how that happens. Or, Oh, uh, how it's done. It does improve uh, 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 soil health and increase or soil organic carbon levels and organic matter levels. And it certainly improves ecological function. It's, it's not unusual in, our, in those crops to have all sorts of things in there, like mushrooms in, in, the, in the crops. And, and, and the, 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 the wildlife and birds have, have increased probably by 200% as well at home. The reason we, we, we are, are, are reducing our fertiliser is, and this is on some very, uh, very uh, uh, sound data that we have, all of the nutrients in the soil are increasing, not decreasing. We get told all the time, gee, we get told a whole heap of bullshit and lies. It's really dreadful. I mean, we, all, we get told all the time by, by, the, by advisors that our nutrients will decline in agriculture. That is absolutely, totally wrong. And the nutrients, all the nutrients, including traces, have increased by, uh, by an average of 172%. Soil carbon level has increased by 204%. Um, uh, water holding capacity of the soil has been increased by 200%. If we look quickly at this, that soil profile there, the one on the, one on the left um, is on, on my soil. That's half a metre, 18 inches. The soils at home were only ever four inches deep, which is my brother's uh, uh, soil, just through the fence, uh, they keep farming conventionally, is uh, still only got four inches of soil. Using these techniques, we, we have built uh, topsoil. Now that's supposed to be impossible. No, it's not. Topsoil is really easy to build and, and quite quickly. That would have taken 15 years probably to build, build to there. Um, and that, those two samples are only about 10 yards apart, just one, one, one side of the fence, one on the other. Is it profitable? Which is a, you know, a, a fair enough question. Everyone asks that, you know, you might be able to do these things, but you'll go broke doing that. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all these figures here, but um, in, in our, 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 the, on today's figures, we were spending $170,000 annually on, on the farm, not counting any labour. This is just basic, very basic costs. We now spend $27,000, so we save $80,000 annually. We, we, we save uh, that, that much uh, a, a, annually, every year. I worked it out, since I changed, uh, I've saved over $2 million uh, since I changed in, in, uh, in the way I do things. I should never have done that because I've got no idea where the two million dollars went. <laughs> so, so, but that's, 
<laughs> is it productive? Yes, it's far more productive. We're running more, more sheep and cattle than we, than we ever did. Our crop yields are similar. We now sell over, over a tonne of native grass seed. Carbon levels are increasing. All the soil nutrients are increasing. And we have $80,000 less, input, uh, less uh, inputs. By managing agriculture and sound ecological principles together, we can improve soil carbon and water holding capacity, nutrient availability and cycling, plant animal and diversity, plant animal disease, soil health, profit, and grow more good food. For agriculture to become, can be more profitable and it can be environmentally regenerative, but our agricultural practices need to function close to how nature had it designed in the first place. Thank you. You said at the start of your talk that um, in, I think, 60 years, the soil, well, you said seven years, but do you think in 60 years, the, at the rate we're going right now, do you think the whole world could be um, more self-sustainable? Agriculture will be uh, less industrial monoculture based? I certainly hope so. Uh, yes, yes, but we need to, to, to get away from the multinational companies to do it. Uh, we, we will never do it following that model, and, as, as many speakers have, have said. But yes, we, oh yes, we can do it. I'm certainly an, an optimist in, in, in this, not a pessimist at all. We can do it really easily. And, and, and not only, we can fix the planet at the same time, that's not a problem. Yep. I was wondering if you had a comparison between the yields of your crops um, without the grazing and with the grazing, um, and whether those yields increased when you grazed them before the harvest. Yep. Um, I do have, and the yields are almost always higher if they're grazed. Um, but it's part of, of how we manage it. We use, we use the, 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 the sheep in particular, but sheep or, or cattle, we could use elephants if you like, doesn't matter. I mean, <laughs> as, as mulchers, you know, as, uh, the, at mulch, they mulch manure um, and, fer and, and, uh, and fertilise. I mean, if you think, uh, I'll just, yeah, go on. If you think of a cow, uh, <clears throat> if, if someone invented a machine that, that mowed, mulched and fertilised all in one pass, you'd pay a fortune for it, but that's exactly what cows do. <laughs> what is your uh, annual rainfall and can these kind of enterprises be done in an area with 8 to 12 inches of rainfall? Yep. <clears throat> uh, the rainfall at, at home is 26 inch, but pasture cropping now is, 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 is practiced all over Australia. There's, there's about 2,000 people that pasture crop now in Australia and in other countries around the world as well. It, it's, it's certainly, it, it's, it's becoming a, 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 um, a universal uh, technique. And um, it, it, in Australia it's practised in down to uh, uh, 10 and, and 12 inch rainfall. You also have to remember that uh, in Australia we have very high evaporation rates. So I mean it, a 10 inch rainfall in Australia is very low because of the, the very high evaporation. So yes, easily. If you can grow uh, uh, any type of a crop um, now, I'm not talking about corn or something like that that's very water hungry, but any type of a, of a crop, this can work. And if you do have a natural dormancy in your grassland or in your prairie, and you, you, and you certainly do here. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I know at Kansas you do, in Kansas you do. We've looked at those areas there. So, yep. Thank you so much. Um, what types of annual crops would be possible to drill or plant into the perennial grass? What type? Are there any types that would not be possible? Types that would work better, especially thinking about a climate like the Southwest? I don't think it matters what type of crop at all. It, uh, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It's not the crop. If it, whatever suits your environment, and if it fits into the natural niche, the natural dormancy of that grassland is, 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 is ideal. And usually in, in that, that dormant period, you also have a, a stock feed gap as well. Like you, there's this feed shortage for animals. So it can be a perfect thing for, ad, for increasing um, available uh, green feed for animals as well. And very, very low cost. Yeah. 
I have a question about how you do it. You, you run a drill, and then the, the wheat seed need, or the oat seed needs to come up, and then go dormant for the winter time, and then it grows. Is that how you do it? Because I'm from dry land wheat country. Yep. And so it's got to come up, you know, and then over winter. Yep. Difficult question to answer in, in, in one sentence because it, I do a, a one and two day workshops on it, but now I'll explain it. Um, it, it. It's no different to any zero, any other zero till crop. It is exactly, we're using zero till machinery, nothing new in that. Uh, there's nothing di new and different in the machinery, in the, in, in the, the planters. Um, and all, all we we're doing is just cutting a very, very small, uh, especially in width, uh, slot uh, through through the the the, the, the um, uh, grassland, just as Gabe showed in his presentation on on what what he was doing, uh, it's the same type of thing, and the 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 um, the crop will come up right along that row. But does it have to overwinter? That's my question. There's some there's uh, there's some uh, partial cropping happening in Norway of all places, and and they plant it um, as probably some of the guys further north do, before the winter, it will sit there under the snow, then, then, then grow. Is that what you were meaning? Kind of, you know, I, all I know is in wheat country, you plant wheat seeds, and they have to come up, and then they have to, you know, you've got to get them to come up. Yeah. So you plant them in September, you hope for rain, and if they come up, you're good. Yeah. And then they go all winter long, Yep. the greens, now yep. Are yep, oh yeah. Yeah, no, I overcomplicated it. Yes, no problems at all. Yeah, to do that. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing. It, it, these are growing th through our winter. The, the, these, those, that series of crop photos of oats was growing in our winter. Yeah.